So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the last session of the NETCHA seminar on continuum mechanics in this semester. Our speaker today is Karel Tuma from the uh, Mathematical Institute of the Charles University in Prague. So Karel got uh, his master's degree in Prague in 2008 and his PhD degree in 2014, again from the Charles University, his advisor was Professor Josef Malek, who is joining us today. And then he spent some time as a postdoctoral uh, fellow in the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research in, in Warsaw, in, in Poland. And Karel is a person who is, has been working in, in um, both in fluids and also the solid mechanics. So he is an expert in non-Newtonian fluids. And today he will tell us something about his other interests, so it's solid mechanics, and he will talk about phase field approach to martensitic transformation. So. Thank you a lot for a nice yeah. introduction. Uh, also good afternoon. So today I will speak about the, I can see some lines here. This is a mistake or? I don't know. Um, so today I will speak about the martensitic transformation in shape memory alloys, phase field model for it, and and simulation. So this work I started on this uh, in the year 2014, as Martin said when I joined uh, the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research at Polish Academy of Sciences. I uh, spent there over three years. And uh, so this work is done in a collaboration with my uh, with my co-workers from Poland. So uh, the first one is Moksen Rzai Hajideji from, from Poland. Jaroslav Ron, he's, he's of course from, uh, from the Mathematical Institute of the Charles University. Patrick Farrell from the Oxford University and Professor Stupkiewicz and Professor Patrick from the, uh, from the Institute of Fundamental Technological Research. So, uh, before I will show the uh, model that we are using, I will show you a movie. It is a movie. There is a ball on the desk. There is a guy who takes a paper clip. He deforms it. He deforms it. It looks like a plastic deformation. And after that, he puts it into the uh, bowl filled with water. And the magic happens. The paper clip gets its original shape. Uh, so in fact, it is not a paper clip made of steel. If it was made of steel, the deformation, the plastic deformation uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be permanent and it could not uh, get uh, its original shape. But here it is made of shape memory alloy. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly it is, but probably some nickel titanium alloy. And here uh, during the deformation, it is not just elastic or possibly plastic deformation. It is at the beginning elastic deformation. And then some phase transformation happens inside the material. So for the paper clip, the paper clip typically exists in uh, different phases. The parent phase called austenite is the phase uh, that uh, exists typically at high temperature and it has higher symmetry than the other phase, the, the martensite. So here in the bowl, there is a hot water. And so when he starts to deform the material, it transforms from austenite to martensite. And it is important that this transformation is reversible. After he puts it into the hot water, there are, uh, uh, thermo, uh, there are thermal stresses that uh, makes the thing that uh, it starts the transformation from martensite back to austenite and it obtained its original shape. So this is one important uh, effect of, of, the, uh, of the shape memory alloys. It is the shape memory effect. The other also very important thing is the pseudo elasticity, sometimes called super, super elasticity. So it is not shown in this picture, but imagine that we have a spring made of the same material. We put it inside the hot water. And so when we start to deform the material, it transforms from austenite to martensite. And it deforms really a lot. The strain can be up to 10%, which is a huge, severe deformation. But once the force is released, 
the spring goes back to the original shape. So it looks like super elastic spring. So even titan, you cannot deform it by 10%. You would go to the plastic deformation. In this talk, I will speak mainly about the super elasticity effect. I will not speak about the shape memory effect um, because in our case, we do not take the temperature into account. Uh, so here in these pictures, you can see several applications that are done with this uh, very nice material. So the first one are the glasses. So here the part of the glasses are made from the shape memory alloy. And the critical temperature that was here quite hot um, is, is uh, around, let's say, zero degrees Celsius. So when you are at the room, temper room temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, it is, uh, it is a temperature above the critical temperature. It acts as a super elastic material. When you start to deform it, again, austenite transforms to martensite. And when you release the force, it goes back immediately to austenite because you are above the room temperature. The other uh, very, very used application uh, is the braces. So here, another effect is used. So uh, when the doctor prepares braces, he does it such that the, uh, so usually it is from the steel, that the steel are acting with the force to the teeth and they want to uh, put the teeth to the, to the, to the uh, good position. After some time, let's say after a month or two months, when the teeth move a little, of course, in case of the steel, the, the force uh, is lowered because usually for steel, when you are in the elastic regime, the, the, the stress is proportional to the, to the strain. So you go to the doctor after the two months, he, uh, uh, he does something with the, with the braces. So uh, the force is again, big enough to put the teeth uh, to, the, to, the, to the position where they should be. But if you use the braces from the shape memory alloy, so here you can see some example of the stress strain care. So here you can see that for a large interval of strain, the stress is almost constant. So let's say if the, if the braces are, uh, if for the first time you get the braces and you are in this point, and after some time, the, the teeth are getting better. You get to this point, so the, the force is almost the same, and you do not need to go to the doctor so often. Another example uh, is the stand in Aorta. And so this is just example showing that it is used in uh, many applications, but it is important to know that this material is, is very, very expensive. However, we are not interested in, in, in such applications and we are interested rather in what is happening at the microscopic level and we want to understand the formation and evolution of microstructure. So here are some pictures of the, uh, of the microstructure and uh, in order to simulate or to model uh, this microstructure, we decided not to use sharp interface approach, which can be quite difficult. And we decided, decided to use the phase field method where the interface is diffuse, not sharp. So usually in the phase field method, uh, we have a global, global unknown order parameter eta. And typically in one phase, it is equal to zero. In other phase, it is equal to one. And as you go across the interface, it changes smoothly from zero to, to one. So it is not sharp. There is not a step change. In this case, when it is zero and one, the order parameter is the volume fraction of the material. So to describe the behavior of the material, we need to constitute two scalar functions. One is responsible for the storage of the energy. This is the free energy. The other is the dissipation, or in this case, the dissipation potential that describes how the body dissipates the energy during, during the deformation. So we have solids, but they are not perfectly elastic. They can dissipate energy during the deformation. In case of phase field, the free energy is split into two parts. The first part is the classic elastic energy. So this is in the bulk, the classic elastic energy. And the other part is the 
interfacial energy that describes how the energy is stored within the interfaces between phases. Uh, we are using uh, a simplified or simple Ginzburg lambda equation where the evolution of the volume fraction eta is proportional so the, where the derivative of volume fraction eta is proportional to the thermodynamic driving force f here l is the constant called mobility it is one over viscosity the thermodynamic driving force is just minus functional derivative of the free energy with respect to eta uh, here psi this is an integral over the whole domain uh, over uh, over the whole domain from 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 the psi free energy density. So you can see that this corresponds to the derivative coming from the Gato derivative. So I will I will comment uh, okay so so here I copied again the Ginzburg Lambda equation just dividing it uh, by the mobility L and telling again what is the thermodynamic driving force. So now, if we define a dissipation potential quadratic in eta dot times one over two L, uh, we can uh, we can formulate the whole model in the global variation as a global variational principle. Because what we know, we if we take the ginzburg lambda equation, we can write this evolution equation for eta as this. So here we take the functional derivative of the total dissipation potential with respect to eta dot. So if we do this, we get just one over L times eta dot. And here, plus functional derivative of psi with respect to eta, which is nothing else than the minus functional derivative. So this is exactly equivalent to the ginzburg lambda equation. Now we can make a easy trick. We can add dots to psi and eta dot. It can be easily uh, verified that if we add the dots, nothing changes. Uh, it is easy if 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 the uh, functions are differentiable. So this is evolution equation for eta. So it looks like this. Uh, in case uh, so for the balance of linear momentum, we assume that there is no inertia because in our case the uh, deformation is really. Uh, it is fast and also all processes are, are extremely fast. So we are in the quasi-static regime. So we just assume that the functional derivative of psi with respect to u is equal to zero, which corresponds to the fact that the divergence of the first pl kirchhoff is equal to zero. So we don't have the inertia. So again, we can add the dots and we can add the clever zero because the dissipation potential does not depend on the displacement. So we obtained these two equations. And these two equations are nothing else than the necessary conditions for finding a minimum of the function of pi, which is a sum of the dissipation potential plus the time derivative of the free energy. And the minimization is with respect to the rates u dot and eta dot. So it is not minimization with respect to u and eta, but with respect to u dot and eta dot. Uh, it is very nice to formulate uh, the problem in this in this very simple uh, way. However, for the numerical implementation, uh, finally, we are just solving for the necessary conditions. We are solving for the Euler Lagrange equations corresponding to, to this minimizer. Also, finally, we are really solving this. So now I will tell you something about uh, the material. So in our case, we are studying copper aluminum nickel shape memory alloys, shape memory alloy. It uh, exists in the austenite cubic phase. So the symmetry of austenite is cubic and it can transform into six variants of orthorhombic martensite. So orthorhombic is lower symmetry. Here you can see cube that is transforming into such orthorhombic. Um, what is important is that the transformation from the cube to, the, to this orthorhomb is measured and it is given by, by a known matrix uh, called transformation strain and it contains just numbers. So it is, it is, a, given, it is a given matrix. 
uh, there are six obvious matrices saying how austenite transforms to six variants of you know, martensites. And this is just saying that there is a relation between these matrices, they are just rotated. Uh, so the crystallographic theory, this is a very old topic in shape memory alloys. It speaks about the uh, uh, about the transformation of uh, of the uh, of the shape memory alloys in the stress-free configuration. So assume that there is no extra stress applied to the uh, to the austenite and martensite, and then we know and it is observed that uh, if, we, if, if you have a material and, and you are looking at it, there is interface, for example, between two variants of martensites. The, crystal, the crystallographic theory says how to obtain the information about the interface if you know the two um, uh, transformation matrices UI and UJ. So you have two, mat two martensites described by two matrices UI and UJ, and there is a compatibility condition between these two uh, martensites. And if you want to, if you want to uh, uh, find the, the how the interface looks like, you solve such so-called uh, training equation. You know? So here, it is almost amazing. You, know? you 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 provide U I U J, and you can solve for L, which is the normal uh, to the interface. A is a shear vector, and then there is a rotation. I will open uh, painting, so you can imagine that here. Uh, so here you have martensite M1, here you have martensite M2, and by solving the equation, you can find the interface and it's normal. So this is two martensites. So the question is, if you can find uh, an interface between austenite and martensite. So in case of copper and nickel, this is not possible. So there are some conditions that have to be satisfied in order to have an interface between austenite and just one variant of martensite. So this condition is not satisfied. So in copper and nickel, this is not possible. However, you can find the interface between austenite and twin martensite. Uh, so twin martensite means that you have layer. So on one side, you have just austenite. This is here. And on the other side, you have uh, you have twin martensite, which means that this is, for example, M1, M2, M1, M2, M1, M2. And together, uh, the interface is, is also zigzag. It is, not, it is not perfectly planar. But of course, the crystallographic theory cannot see this. But it uh, predicts the normal of the austenite twin martensite interface. You know? So the normal would be in this direction. This normal is called here M. Then there is some another shear vector. And uh, for example, this eta bar, this is the volume fraction of this twin martensite. You know? For example, here I put it like here is 30% of this martensite and 70% of this martensite. So I'm showing this because there is a simple theory that can predict something under assumption that the material is, is not stressed. And uh, it is good for verification of the finite element simulations. So uh, next, so as I already said, the deformation in these materials are really huge. It cannot be assumed that the uh, that the deformations are small and you, you cannot use the small strain theory. So what we are doing, we are splitting the total deformation gradient F into the elastic part and the transformational part in this multiplicative way. So here, this is a picture from uh, some simulation. There is a red face and blue face. In red phase, let's say that the volume fraction is equal to zero. In blue phase, it is equal to one. So in the red phase, it is easy. We know from the crystallographic theory how the transformation strain matrix uh, looks like. It is a matrix of numbers. So we can directly compute the elastic part of transformation strain of, of deformation gradient from the total deformation gradient. The same holds 
in the in the blue face. Inside, uh, when in the interface, when eta is not exactly equal to zero or one, we have to mix them somehow. Um, so mean in most of the simulations, uh, we use little different mixing, which is which turned out uh, to be uh, very uh, complicated and it did not uh, it did not provide uh, very good results. So finally, we decided to use such linear mixing. So we mix transformation states strains in a linear way, and then we compute the elastic part of the formation gradient. The material is anisotropic. Uh, again, for copper and nickel, for austenite, and all variants of martensite, or it is enough to compute it for one and then rotate it, the, the anisotropic elastic stiffness matrices are known. So, uh, we again have to do something in the interface and we are mixing them linearly. So, so here, first I will just speak about only two phases and then I will go to, to, to more phases. So this, is, uh, so this is the free energy for two phases. No, and then we have to prescribe the, uh, the elastic energy, bulk free energy density. So here you can see that this is the classical sun venom kirchhoff energy, EE is the green strain, computed as one half of the right cauchy green minus identity, and uh, plus uh, the chemical potential. Uh, so here you can see it is volume fraction times gradient of, uh, of you know, times delta of phi zero. So this is the chemical potential. So typically we have eta equal to zero in austenite. So if we are in the super elastic regime and we, we deform the material, it changes to one. So then thanks to this term, it wants to go back to the, uh, to the austenite phase. So the main problem with this energy is that it is San Vena. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not a good energy from the mathematical point of view. However, it is, it is very uh, popular in the engineering papers. But uh, at some point, we got to the position that we were not able to comp to use this energy for very large deformations. So we did quite small modification. Instead of using San Venant with green strain, we are using this quadratic uh, quadratic energy with Henke model with Henke strain HE, which is logarithm of the right Cauchy green and. Uh, since this uh, grows to uh, infinity slowly, uh, slowly, uh, then then the San Venant Kirchhoff we decided to use this because compared to uh, compared to San Venant Kirchhoff it it converges much better. You can also understand the San Venant Kirchhoff as an approximation of this of this Henke model because if you look at the Henke strain one half logarithm of the right Cauchy green. So this is the first order approximation of logarithm. So this is what we, we are using. The reason is uh, that we were able to, to compute it. So this was the bulk free energy for two phases. Now uh, I will say something about the interface energy for two phases. The mostly used interface energy is so-called double well energy. The interface energy always consists of two parts, the gradient part that makes the solution smooth, or at least differentiable, and the rest. And according to the rest, uh, the, the potential is called. So here you can see it is eta squared times one minus eta squared. So it looks like this, and it is a double well. Right? It has two minima in zero and one. The other potential, which is uh, interfacial energy, which is not used so often, uh, is the double obstacle potential. There is a parabola, eta times one minus eta. It looks like this. It does not have minimum in zero and one, but it goes to minus infinity. If you go with eta to minus infinity or plus infinity. So this is quite big disadvantage that it does not have a minimum in zero and one, but it has many advantages. One of them is that it provides sharper interface and we have to pay for this. We have to somehow restrict that the solution eta will be between zero and one. So here you can see this 
dashed line. So we will need to have a restriction on eta. So you can see also that the interfacial energy contains uh, two parameters, uh, the L, which is interface thickness parameter, and gamma, which has a physical meaning. The physical meaning is interfacial energy density. So if you are in the stress-free configuration in one dimension, you take this interfacial energy psi gamma the density divided by gamma and integrated it over R. So you get the, such functional. And if you minimize this functional, you find out that in the minimum, the value of this functional is equal to one, which means that really the meaning of the interfacial uh, of gamma is that it is interfacial energy density. No, because without gamma, you get the, the size of the interface. Uh, in 1D, it is simple. In 2D, if you, if you draw uh, an interface and you integrate it over R2, you obtain the length of the curve. No, so this is a very important prop, uh, property of, of these two energies. So we can also look how the, uh, uh, how the uh, profile looks like in a one dimension. So for double well, it is hyperbolic tangent, which goes exponentially to one and zero. So uh, mathematically, it never goes to one and zero, but from the numeric point of view, uh, it is close enough to one and zero, but the interface is quite thick. For the double obstacle, you get the sinus whose interface, uh, the, the diffuse, the thickness of the, um, uh, the thickness of the diffuse interface is exactly equal to pi times L. No? So L is a parameter that uh, is proportional to the, uh, to the real thickness of the diffuse interface. So this was two phases. And uh, for uh, to, to model the physical reality, in copper aluminum nickel shape memory, all we need to describe not just austenite and, for example, one variant of martensite, but we have to be able to describe austenite and all six variants of martensite. So to do it, we need seven uh, volume fractions: eta zero volume fraction of austenite and eta one to eta six volume fractions of martensites. And since they are volume fractions, we know that they have to sum to zero and uh, to one, which means that we do not need all of them. We can just compute eta zero knowing eta one to eta six. Eta zero is equal to one minus the sum of eta one to eta six. And we are using the double obstacle potential or some type of double obstacle potential. So we need to satisfy the physical constraint that eta i's are volume fractions. So they are between zero and one. So which in this case, when you compute eta zero from eta one to eta six is equivalent to the fact that all eta i's are greater or equal to zero. So it is enough to have just one inequality, not two-sided inequality. So for the interfacial energy, uh, so we use some, uh, some type of uh, double obstacle and we are using a modification uh, of uh, interfacial energy by Steinbach. It looks like this. It contains uh, several parameters. Uh, one is gamma ij. So this is the interfacial energy between phase i and phase j. Typically the interfacial energy between austenite and some variant of martensite is 10 times higher than, by, than, than between different variants of martensites. So we have to distinguish between these. And here for simplicity, we just take one, uh, the, the same uh, interface thickness parameter L for, for all combinations. And the last thing is the dissipation potential. So this dissipation potential is again the quadratic one, quadratic in eta dot squared, again, uh, thanks to the non-negativity, uh, the second law of thermodynamics is satisfied. But the problem with this uh, dissipation potential is that it is just purely rate dependent. So now 
I prescribed, uh, I, I, I've given you the model that was used for the whole physical, uh, the simulation of the whole physical reality that is happening in copper and nickel, shape memory alloy. And now I will go little, uh, I will say something little different. I will speak little uh, about the uh, rate independent dissipation. The reason why we have chosen the rate, dis uh, rate dependent dissipation for the uh, for the large simulation is the uh, is the implement implementation issue because implementing this is quite easy even it does not perfectly agree with the physical reality in fact the purely rate dependent relation between the time derivative of the volume fraction and the, dri and the driving force this is not observed so here you can see to uh, graphs and dependence of stress on strain. And it shows that during the loading and unloading, you can observe a hysteresis curve. The same, you, you can observe also the same also with the dependent dissipation, but you obtain the hysteresis curve due to the uh, speed, uh, non-zero speed. Here, you can see that even if you decrease the speed of the, uh, of the loading and unloading, the uh, uh, area under the hysteresis curve is still positive and, does, and it does not go to zero. No? So this corresponds, the area corresponds to the, the dissipated energy. Here, this simulation was done for very, very low uh, speeds. And you can see that, that still, the hysteresis, the area is still uh, greater than zero. So here are a few graphs. So the original, the rate dependent, says that the relation between the eta dot and the thermodynamic driving force is linear. So this looks like this. And uh, speaking about fluids, so one can imagine if this was a dependence of stress, uh, of, 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 of the shear stress on the shear rate. So this would correspond to the Navier-Stokes. Another possibility is that the uh, material does not transform up to some critical driving force is reached. And then it can transform with arbitrary speed. So this would correspond to perfectly plastic material. However, again, this is something which is not observed because usually then there is some dependence of the driving force on eta dot. So the last one uh, corresponds mostly to the reality. So here, uh, after the critical driving force is reached, the so for the solid line, the uh, material transforms linearly with the driving force. So this would correspond in fluids to the Bingham model. Another possibility is that it later it depends nonlinearly in fluids corresponding to Ashley Berkeley model. Uh, so this is something we did in 2016, 17, 16, in uh, when I was in Poland, uh, and uh, we we implemented uh, this uh, model in ASFM, eighth gen finite element uh, code. And this implementation is quite difficult due to this uh, non-differentiability in, in, in this corner, in this corner. So, so this graph corresponds to the fact that eta dot is equal to L times F minus critical driving force if the driving force is greater than, uh, than the critical driving force. So this is this part then it is here zero if driving force is between minus fc and fc and again it grows linearly uh, when we are below uh, minus critical driving force implicitly this relation can be written in this way using the signum and so before we showed how this is related to the dissipation potential if there is no signum or or F, when FC is equal to zero, if we add this FC, we have to add to the dissipation potential 
fc times absolute value of the, the derivative of uh, of eta so this is very heavy to implement if you do not want to do any approximation and at the time we decided to do it exactly without any any simplification and we did it with the help of augmented lagrangians uh, based on the book by Bertsekas. Uh, so this is something that is not possible to implement in uh, many uh, finite element codes uh, because we were performing some uh, some calculations on the level of, of Gauss points in the Gauss quadrature. So uh, this is the reason why we decided later not to involve the rate independent dissipation when solving the very large problems on the supercomputer. So I will show you uh, some results with the, uh, with the model that takes into account this rate independent uh, processes. So we have just two dimensional problem and we have a square of side three micrometers with this material parameter. So this is this interface thickness, this is interface energy density, this is the mobility. And uh, we assume uh, two variants of martensite, of copper, copper or nickel. If you remember the numbers from slide uh, four or five, this is exactly this. They are just, these numbers are, are just here. You know, we are just in 2D. The boundary condition is such that uh, it is stress-free. Of course, we have to prescribe something because we have quasi-static regime. So we are just getting rid of the of the uh, rigid motions. And initially we prescribe a random initial condition for eta and this condition is close to 0 0.5 and we let it evolve to the steady solution. So here you can see nine pictures. In every column you have different initial condition in different random initial condition. And in every line you have different critical driving forces FC, two megapascals, one megapascal, 0 0.5 megapascals. So I'm repeating FC equal to zero megapascal corresponds to the rate dependent process. So this is rate independent. What you can see that for the highest um, uh, critical driving force, the, uh, the microstructure stacks very soon. And you can see uh, a lot of small areas of two phases, blue and red. And as you decrease the critical driving force, the areas are bigger you know, because uh, th there is nothing that would stop the transformation. You know? So all of this, this is the steady solution. So here it is a movie. Uh, it is the movie, this is just a smaller square. And we are comparing the evolution for rate independent process with critical driving force equal to one megapascal and rate dependent where FC is equal to zero megapascal. So here, this is the, this is the timeline. So you can see that it is not, the movie is not linear in time. And what you can see that after some time, uh, the microstructure for rate independent uh, model uh, stacks and it does not move anymore. So this is now the steady solution. But for the rate dependent, it slowly goes. And finally, everything transforms only into one, uh, into one phase, the blue phase. So since the implementation of this model due to the augmented Lagrangians is, is, is quite heavy, uh, we had to, had to be sure that we did not do any mistake. So we simplify the problem and we try to compute or get some analytic solution for some simple thing. And uh, we looked here because here you can see that in the corner, the interface is propagating towards the corner, uh, both for the rate dependent and rate independent. Uh, something happens. Sometimes it can stop. So we were computing this problem. We have this, uh, we have such domain uh, with the corner. Uh, the interface is distanced uh, xi from the corner, and we want to know with what speed the interface is propagating towards the corner. So as I said, in our case, the configuration is such that it is in a stress-free configuration. 
So we assume that the uh, uh, elastic part of energy is equal to zero. So the total potential, the functional pi, is equal to the time derivative of the interfacial energy plus dissipation potential. So in our specific case, it reduces to such, uh, to such formula depending on xi, which is the distance from the corner, and xi dot. This is the velocity of the corner, uh, velocity of the interface. Now, and we, we were looking for the necessary condition uh, since there is no displacement and we have this, uh, we have this minimizer with respect to the with respect to the, the rates. So we have to compute uh, as a minimizer the minimum of pi with respect to psi dot, which gives this relation. And if you look into this relation, you can find out that the corner is propagating only when psi dot is greater than zero. And this happens only under this condition. So if driving force times the distance from the corner plus gamma is greater than zero, then it propagates. And then we can compute the, the, the speed of the interface and we plotted it with the solid lines for different, for different uh, critical driving forces. So here you can see the green one is the rate dependent and then we have several rate independent with different driving forces. So this is plotted with the solid line and we compare it with the finite element simulation, which is, which is given with, with the symbol, with the symbols and you can see a very nice agreement. So we are quite sure that the implementation uh, worked quite well. So I will repeat again. So this was implemented with ASVM agent system. It can parallelize only within the shared memory. So you can never run it on the supercomputer or never at the state as, as the code works. Uh, uh, and we used here the direct part diesel solver, you know, because due to the augmented Lagrangians, the, uh, the complexity of metrics is, is not nice. Of course, it is, it is a settle point problem uh, because of the, of the Lagrange multipliers. So uh, with the same code, we computed um, Compression of copper aluminum nickel. So it is an experiment by San Juan and the others from 2009, who published it in, in the Nature paper. So they took such a pillar made of copper aluminum nickel. The height was 3.8 micrometers. And they used an indentation device with a nano indenter whose tip was a ball of radius 600 nanometers. And during the transformation, they observed uh, during the, the during the compression, they observed the transformation of uh, austenite to to some variant of martensite, uh, and they recorded a nice hysteresis curve. So this was computed with ASVM SGEN. We have chosen the uh, material parameters and also the thickness such that we are able. To first to compute it you know, because we were not able to compute the very fine problem. So the maximum that we can afford with the direct solver in 3D with this was around 1 million degrees of freedom. So the L has to be comparable to the, uh, to the mesh, uh, mesh size. And the, the physical material parameters were chosen such that uh, it agrees with the parameters with the literature and it agrees with the recorded hysteresis curve. So here, uh, this is the hysteresis curve. The, uh, the red points are the, are the experimental values by San Juan and the others. And the simulation is in blue. So originally, uh, the solid blue line is uh, the simulation if we assume that the ball at the contact is perfectly rigid. But, and this is the, this is the reason for this, um, for this fast jump in the in the in the load, but of course it, it cannot be perfectly rigid. So usually the ball, the indenter, the, the indenter is connected to the indentation de device by something that has some elastic stiffness. So finally we adjusted the stiffness k. So we assume that there is some spring between the indentation device and 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 the ball, uh, and we adjusted it to 200 newtons. Uh, per meter such that 
it agrees better to the uh, to the uh, experimental data. Uh, and, and the agreement is, let's say, reasonable. What we also did, uh, because uh, our aim was to study the effect of the rate independent model. So we studied what is happening if we modify the uh, speed of loading and unloading. And clearly what you can see, so this is the rate dependent uh, model with critical driving force equal to zero. And you can see as you decrease the velocity, the hysteresis curve goes to zero. Also, here is something that happens during the first formation of the, uh, of the other phase. In case of rate independent model with uh, FC uh, here equal to 1.2 megapascals, you can see that the hysteresis curve is still, um, is still there. So this is the movie. No, and you can really see that the resolution is nothing extra. And this is the maximum we could afford at this time, at the time. And of, of course, we wanted to have such enhanced model with the with the rate independent uh, dissipation. No, but you can see at the beginning of the movie that the the mesh is not somehow very fine. It was the maximum we were able to compute. So, uh, so later I uh, returned uh, back to Prague after 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 the postdoc in Warsaw, and I always uh, had a dream to compute something very big. I mean, compute something with uh, many many degrees of freedom, and uh, I wanted to see really some nice microstructure because here you can see uh, we we could compute only two phases and. Even here, you can see that the thickness is, is, is quite big. You know? So you cannot afford to, to get nice microstructure. And I wanted to, to see a nice microstructure coming from the finite element simulation. So the aim was to rewrite the code into and implement it in, into something that, that will work also on the supercomputer. So first, we did it with Phoenix. And uh, we tried, uh, it was clear that we cannot use the direct solver anymore. So we need to use the iterative linear solver. And in Phoenix, uh, the best thing we tried was the algebraic multigrid, but we had a problem with the preconditioning. So we did several tests, but it always happened that when the, uh, when the, uh, when, when the phase started, one phase started to transform to the other phase, so the linear server had a lot of problems and it stopped converging. So at the beginning, well, this is important, at the beginning, when you take, for example, this pillar, you compress it. So at the beginning, of course, there is just elastic response. And in this elastic response, this algebraic multigrid worked quite well. But after some time, when the when the stress is high enough and it starts to transform, so then the, there is a problem that the algebraic uh, uh, multigrid stopped working. So uh, uh, I was very lucky because uh, Patrick Farrell was visiting Prague in the year 2019. I was telling him uh, these problems with, with algebraic multigrid and uh, he was very keen uh, on the, uh, the Fidrake finite element uh, code that is tightly connected to the PETC uh, linear algebra library and it has a geometric multigrid. So when he was there, he suggested, he tried to take the code from Phoenix, rewrite it to Fidray. This is important that they are, this is very similar code, so it is not so, so difficult, but he's, uh, he, uh, he used the uh, geometric multigrid and used there some preconditioners and it's started to work somehow. And it was quite, quite good. So we migrated uh, from ASFAM to Phoenix, then to Fidrate, and hope that we are able to compute very large problems. So now I will tell something about the computational treatment. Uh, so as you know, so uh, we have to, uh, we have to take care about the restriction for the volume fraction eta. We know that all etas are greater or equal to zero. So earlier with ASFAM, again, we using 
we use the augmented Lagrangians and we were able to satisfy this, these conditions exactly. Huh? So, but again, Lagrangians, multipliers, settle point problem, direct solver and so. So we decided to use some simple method. We used the penalty method. So uh, this is standard penalty method. Just remember that epsilon eta is the penalty, is the penalization parameter for this restriction. No? So this is called epsilon eta. Higher, better, of course, it, it makes the solution, the numerical si simulation worse. The next problem is the Henke strain because we need to compute the logarithm the matrix logarithm. So again, in ASFM, uh, there, uh, uh, there is a function to compute it exactly using the uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. It is implemented quite efficiently, but such thing is not available in fire rate. So we decided again to approximate. It. So the first test was to use the Taylor expansion and approximate it by Taylor. So uh, but this was not sufficient. I will show you something about this. And later we decided to use the Pare approximation. So if we take, uh, if you take a scalar logarithm of X, so you can approximate it by such truncated Taylor expansion. So you, you have Taylor polynomial of order M. Now the problem with the Taylor series uh, for logarithm is that the radius of convergence is just equal to one. So this converges only for X between zero and two. And if you go away, it stops converging. But of course it can happen that the strain is, is very big and it happens. So we decided to use another approximation. This is the Pare approximation. It is Pare approximation of order M N. In numerator, there is a polynomial of degree. M and in the denominator is the polynomial of degree n. So it is a rational function. Uh, but approximation of logarithm, of scalar logarithm of order two, two looks like this, three, three looks like this. So the, the first thing is, is that you just try to uh, try to plot it in the logarithm graph. So here, this is, it is logarithmic in X where the, uh, log x is equal to the linear it looks as a straight function as a straight uh, curve so here on the right this is the approximation with taylor so you can see that really if x is greater than two it it goes to minus and plus infinity and of course it, it would be possible to use some trick not to have it nicely convergent between zero and two, but to put it between zero and infinity. This is of course possible, but if you if you look closely to zero, you can see that even Taylor of order eight, this is the uh, dark blue line, is not very close to the real logarithm. On the other hand, if you compare Pade approximations of different orders, so you can see that even just by the approximation of order two, two is, is better than Taylor expansion of, of order eight. So this is a good idea. Maybe we can use the Pare approximation. However, so this is, this is just for the scalar functions. Luckily in 1988, uh, Kenny and Laub solved this for, for us. So they wrote a paper uh, first saying, that uh, for fixed order of pare approximant, this means that this m plus n is equal to constant. Uh, the error is smallest or the approximation is best if m is equal to n. So that is why I'm showing two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five, nothing else. And they also say something about the matrices. So if we have a matrix X whose norm is lower or equal than C, then the approximation error of the matrix logarithm is bounded by the error of scalar logarithm. No? So really, Pade is much better than Taylor. So we decided to use Pade. And uh, so for the matrices, for example, Pade to two looks like this. So instead of dividing by polynomial, you multiply it by, uh, you multiply by inverse of, of, of the matrices, of the sum of matrices. 
and we perform the test with just elastic material, no phase transformation with anisotropic Henke model. So it was very similar to what we, what we will compute later. We took a box and we were compressing it from the top with, uh, with the contact. And we were recording stress versus strain or load versus indentation. And so this was done uh, in ace plan HGM system. As I said, it, uh, it provides the matrix logarithm, uh, which, is, which is exact. It is in the closed form. And uh, so this is the black line. And you can, you can compare it with the approximation of Taylor and Pade. So what you can see is if you take Taylor of the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth order, after some time, this black line is that uh, the, the simulation stops converging and it crashes. So with this, with this deformation, it, it already uh, stops working. The odd orders of Taylor are a little better than the even but still it, it crashes very soon. Uh, with the PADE, it is, it is much better. So this is the reason why we decided to use PADE. It is also important to say that uh, before that, uh, it, 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 uh, the, the, you, you obtain the same results, both, some, uh, both for PADE and Taylor and the closed form you know, for, some, for some small strains. So, with PADE, you can get much, much farther and, and it corresponds to the, uh, to the implementation in ASFAM. Now this implementation, this was done by Professor Stupkevich and uh, Jose Korel, who is developing the ASFAM Christian code. So there is a paper on it. It is not just some, some black box. And this was published. So we decided to use PADE approximation, but now we have to decide uh, which order. So already for phase field, and for the um, transformations, we perform the simulation uh, for different uh, PADE approximations, one, one, two, two, three, three. So what a, uh, PADE one, one is, is very weak approximation. So we would like not to use it. PADE two, two is just a little more expensive than one, one. And PADE three, three is much more expensive, mainly the assembly time. So finally we decided because of the CPU time to use PADE approximation to two. You know, so so uh, in our simulations, we were optimizing almost everything with respect to the CPU time. So as I said, we implemented the code that is capable of taking into account the transformation between austenite and six variants of martensite. We implemented it with a five drake finite element code. It provides automatic differentiation as ASFAM, ASGEN, and Phoenix. Uh, for the time stepping, we, we used backward order with adaptive time step. So this was written heuristically. We are, we are just looking on the number of Newton iterations in the previous time step. Uh, the domain is discretized by tetrahedra and all unknowns are piecewise linear. For the non-linearities, we are using the standard full Newton with very low stopping criterion 10 to minus 11. And now I will come to the uh, linear solver. So the aim is to compute very, really large problems on the supercomputer in Ostrava. So we are using the GMRS iterative solver. The stopping criterion for, for this outer iterative solver is 10 to minus five. And as a precondition for this GMS, we are using geometric multigrid with standard recycle and the number of levels of meshes depends on the on the size of the problem so it differed from three to five on the courses level of the of the multigrid we are using direct over mums and as a smoothener between the levels we are using gmrs with fixed number of iterations this is four and for this inner gmrs we are using as a precondition of the point block Jacobi. so uh, we were playing quite a lot with this smoothener, trying different things. And finally, we have chosen uh, the, uh, we have chosen 
such smoothener and such preconditioner that the total CPU time is the is the lowest because we have to write a proposal for the CPU time and the CPU time is 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 quite expensive for us and uh, not in money but we get just some fi um, finite amount of CPU time so we have to use them uh, wisely. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is about the implementation. Now I will describe the problem. So at the beginning, we have a box made of copper armor nickel shape memory alloy. It has some special orientation, 0, 1, 1. And at the beginning, it is in the austenite phase. So then we take an indenter, a ball indenter, and we co compress it by contact from the top. And uh, we are indenting it to, to some value 25 nanometers. You know, the height is 200 nanometers, so it is really high. Uh, and then we are going back. So here, the contact is again done easily just with the penalty method. Again, before we used augmented Lagrangians. This is, uh, this is at this time impossible for us in fire drake. So we are using the penalty method. In the penalty method, we want that the gap between between the ball and the material in the current uh, con uh, current state is greater or equal to zero. Yeah? So if this if this gap is lower than zero, we are adding this quadratic term. So here, please please remember that epsilon n is the penalization parameter for the contact. So here you can see a movie. So the gray one, this is austenite. And as you compress it, many variants of martensites appear. You can see that this light blue does not appear. You can also see that the matrix structure is quite complex. You can see a twinning between violet and green martensite. And of course, there is interface with, with this gray austenite. Here you can see the dependence of stress on strain. It shows a hysteresis curve. I will repeat, the hysteresis curve is given not due to the rate independent process, but due to the finite velocity of the loading and unloading. So here uh, is a comparison to the crystallographic prediction. So as I said, the crystallographic prediction, this is a classical theory that says how the interface between, uh, between martensites uh, is oriented under stress-free configuration. Of course, this is extremely stressed due to, the, due to the indenter, but still you can see that at least for the violet and green martensite, it agrees very, very well with the crystallographic prediction. So we can be at least little sure that the simulation uh, is reasonable. So next we studied the effects of the penalty parameters the penalization parameter for, for the restriction on the, on the volume fraction. So here, this is some, some indicator function. It is a sum of absolute values of negative parts of eta i's. And you can see that if we take epsilon eta, for example, equal to 200 gigapascals, uh, the error, so the eta i's are below, below zero is a few percents. If we increase it to 1,000, it is below 1%. So finally, we decided to use 1,000. Uh, the effect of the penalization parameter for the contact can be seen, for example, here. This is, again, the dependence of the load on indentation. It is just loading. There is, not un there is no unloading. If we take small value of the penalization, 10, it is the blue line. If we take 100 and 1,000, it is close to each other. Finally, uh, we took just 100, not 1,000 to, to make the simulation a little cheaper. So since we uh, computed the problem uh, on, the, on the supercomputer, we wanted, or we were interested how well the, uh, the code scales. So it was computed specifically on the Barbora cluster. It contains 200 computa com computational nodes. Every contains uh, two 18 cores uh, CPUs. And 
for the weak scalability test, uh, we performed the simulation of five problems. Every problem with uh, different uh, uh, different mesh, and we have chosen the problem such that that approximately the size of the problem with respect to the degrees of freedom per one core is approximately the same. So the smallest problem was 2.5 million degrees of freedom. The largest was 150 million uh, degrees of freedom. So here in this table, you can see uh, several things. The first is the number of time steps. It is evolution and evolution problem. You can see that it little increases, but not significantly. Uh, the same holds for the number of nonlinear Newton iterations. Again, you can see that it little increases, not much. This is caused also by the fact that with finer mesh, uh, we are we are describing the physical reality in a better way so it is not strange that it is it is it is more uh, it is more demanding so then uh, what is important is the total number of linear solver iterations so this is the number of outer GMS iterations you can see that it increases but not somehow not a lot so this is this is very important it, it means that the preconditioner is, is quite good. However, what you can see is that the total linear solver time is quite big and it increases with the degrees, number of degrees of freedom. This is also given here in this graph. So you can see that up to 64 million degrees of freedom, it increases just slightly. You know, this is the linear solver, solver time. But then if we go from 64 million degrees of freedom to 150, there is a there is a big increase, but still, the assembly time is higher than the linear solver time. So, in total, if, if it is not so bad. It also shows that the the implemented model is quite complex, and to us just to assemble the residuum and the tangent matrix, it is it is it is very heavy. Uh, so the, we have some idea. Why we think that the, uh, the the linear solver time for 150 is much higher than for 64 million degrees of freedom, and we think that this is due to the architecture of Barbora Barbora cluster. Barbora cluster contains five racks, every with 40 computing nodes, and the communication speed inside the rack is significantly faster than within different racks. And you can see that up to 64 million degrees of freedom, the whole simulation fitted into one rack. But here, for the largest simulation, we needed 64 computational nodes for which we need two racks. So there was this extra rack uh, communication that probably made this, uh, made the uh, linear solver time uh, higher. So here you can see also the uh, the comparison of the microstructure on a cross section for different simulations. So, surely 2.5 million is really, it is very coarse mesh and uh, you cannot resolve the, the microstructure. Reasonably, it is from 19 million degrees of freedom and up to, let's say, 64 and 150 is, is, is very similar. But you can, you can really see that the number of twins for 150 million degrees of freedom is still bigger than for 64. Unfortunately, we cannot afford a larger problem. So of course, it would be nice not to compute the problem on a, uh, on a structured mesh. It would be fixed mesh. It would be nice to make uh, adaptive mesh, but uh, uh, so far we are not able to do it. So uh, I will conclude. So I showed you uh, our model for martensitic transformation, specifically for copper aluminum nickel. I showed you some enhanced model with rate independent dissipation that uh, agrees quite well with the physical reality and it can be observed in the, in the experimental data. However, such implementation is not treatable uh, for large scale simulations. So, 
After modification of the, of the model, we are able to implement it and compute very large problems at the supercomputer in Ostrava. And we showed a reasonable weak scalability. So the paper is already published. It is published in the SMAME paper. So it is not just first decile, it is like first, uh, first percentile. So it is, it is, it is very good, uh, very good journal. Um, so here, so now, because it took us almost three years to, to, to do the implementation of, uh, of this code for a supercomputer. So we, of course, want to use this, uh, use this code. And uh, so here I can show you some movies. This is still copper, aluminum, nickel, uh, uh, different orientation. The previous was zero, one, one. This is one, one, one. And uh, this is a comparison of different uh, elasticity. This is anisotropic. This is different anisotropic elasticity. This is isotropic. So the physical one is this one. Again, you can see very nice microstructure, maybe even nicer than in case of the orientation 011. So thank you. That is all.